So next we have Greg Godbout and Greg co-founded um, GSA's Innovation Consultancy 18F and pioneered a transformation model for creating an agile enterprise inside the federal government. He now works to bring public sector digital service transformation and Seabrain's F2 software to the US market. He's provided a poll for us to respond to. The question is, what is the most difficult, what is most difficult about implementing Agile? Is it changing policies and procedures or changing acquisition strategy or changing habits or is it hiring trained and skilled staff? Let's take a moment to respond to that and I'll read our results. 21% of us said that changing policies and procedures is the most difficult thing about implementing Agile. 16% said changing acquisition strategy. 54% said changing habits and 10% said hiring um, skilled staff. So welcome, Greg. Thank you, I hope everybody can hear me okay. We can. All right, um, gonna go ahead and just get started and go through it. And, and thanks to Ann and Chris, the people uh, who went before to mention some of the work we did, but particularly Ann, we, uh, I was the chief technology officer uh, under Ann's group at EPA, where she was the CIO. And we did a, a tremendous amount of work with digital transformation and government transformation. Um, and you'll see that some of our slides do look very sim similar. <laughs> so um, my first slide, really getting into digital transformation and, and moving towards Agile, um, it's, it's important to note, um, I was the first executive director of 18F. And when I left 18F, I went to EPA and the purpose of that was for us to get closer to organizational transformation. And as CTO at EPA, we use some of 18F services to come in and prove value. But what we were doing is um, essentially building an agile enterprise. And I thought in our cross-functional working team, we're all the CXOs, if you would. So um, this is what I'm going to be talking about is at that enterprise level, how you can change that higher stuff. I also think it applies because there was a poll earlier uh, that was talking about sort of hindrances of doing agile and at least 50 i think it was 52 percent or more or 53 percent or more of the people responded that it was either middle management or senior senior management um and and i found that in the federal government my work in the federal government as well it's very easy for people to say hey go do agile but when they realize you have to help help us and change the organization it was a whole it was a very different discussion and so i'm going to get into the details of that um, and where I'm going to start is what's called the cone of uncertainty. And the cone of uncertainty is they took, uh, this, this, is, this study's been done a number of times, and they take sort of large complex projects, usually projects that are a million dollars or more, or sometimes 10 million or more, and they do a retrospective on it. And they basically look and say, at every point in time along the bottom axis is time. Um, what is the estimate? So how much, how much time do you think it's going to take for the project to finish? Um, and how much cost do you think it's going to be? And what they found <clears throat> is, and you can see the cone, is that in the beginning, people are wildly uncertain. In fact, statistically, it's, it's probably you're going to be incorrect on all of your guesses. Um, but over time, as the team works on the project, their estimate of how much it's going to cost and how long it's going to take actually comes down. And it's not really drawn to scale this photo or this image, but basically that point where the uncertainty comes down dramatically is, is around 25 to 30% of the time in there. The problem is in the beginning of a project, you don't know how much time there's gonna be because statistically it's improbable to know. So here you have to start on the journey and the only thing you do know, and the only thing that this graph really sort of proves over time is you don't know what you don't know in the beginning. So you should embrace uncertainty up front and do discovery and figure things out and then commit to things longer. And you see the dollar signs on my chart because we should be spending very little money up front embracing uncertainty. And this gets to Ann's points about starting small. And then later as the certainty grows and you know what you're actually building and you've defined value and proved value, then go ahead, commit larger dollars. But of course, in most government agencies, particularly when you're getting it around acquisitions, you, you get to a point where um, you start to see that we do the opposite in government typically. We commit all the dollars up front. And this is inherently the core underlying core problem that we have. Um, the other thing at that was, uh, apparent at EPA 
is there was a strong support, there was strong support for lean thinking. Um, there wasn't a lot of discussion around lean startup. And so I did spend a lot of time introducing lean startup. And the way I did was to basically describe it in a simple way to say that lean thinking is an oversimplification, but basically saying maximize customer value while minimizing waste for continuous improvement. And the lean startup is maximizing customer value while minimizing waste for building a ma for building something new or a major pivot. And so many projects at EPA were stuck. Like, people couldn't get started. And it's very hard to start when you're following sort of Toyota's lean thinking when Toyota already had production plants, right? And the, on the lean startup side, we needed to get things going and move it forward. Um, by starting anew and starting fresh. So we took those two models and applied that to the cone of uncertainty. And so in the early stages, if you will, before that 25% point where uncertainty comes way down, um, go ahead and use lean startup methodologies. Um, look for contracts that are time and materials. You wanna do your pilots, your alphas, your betas in this phase. Um, you want to build and prove your MVP in this phase. You're working on proving hypothesis and things like that. In the lean thinking area, once the, certain, the uncertainty has come down and you know the value, you want to look at contracts that are firm fixed price. You want to go into full production mode. You want to look at in continuous improvement and, and bringing down the costs. Um, and that helped because these books or these, these philosophies, these methodologies bring practical examples to the table so that executives across the entire enterprise knew what to do in which phase. Um, then we brought agile development into it. And you could also call this really agile delivery. Um, and we broke it into three phases. Now, now I think most people in agile use like uh, alpha, beta, and then in production or something to that effect. Um, we I wanted to name it what we wanted you to do primarily. So this was the naming convention that we came up with was discovery in the first phase. Um, sorry for the slides there. Um, discovery in the first phases and um, I'm going to finish the one. Discovery the first phase, then development in the second phase, and then continuous improvement. And while doing discovery, you want to embrace uncertainty. Right. The reason for this is, and, and this is the mistake people make in government. I mean, I, every time I heard someone say, hey, let's get started. We need a win. Let's do some low hanging fruit. All you're doing is extending the cost and the length of your project. If you look back at that cone of uncertainty, what you're going to find is if you embrace the uncertainty first, the things you're most scared of, they're usually not as daunting as you think they are. But those are also the things that are risk, the things that you don't know. If you bring that risk down early by, and commit little dollars to discovering how to bring that risk down early, it's going to save you exponentially over the rest of the life of the contract. And so we want to invest in small short-term experience during this, avoid low-hanging fruit, and discover a likely minimum viable product for those who, who know lean startup methodologies. And that got us to the second phase, which is development. And this was a surge. This is, you've, you've discovered what you think is a likely, likely minimum viable product, and you want to put it into play. Here's where you want to invest a lot of money in development, and you want to prove value. You don't want to be tied to um, cost savings is not your priority here. Here you want to, as quick as possible, prove value and get a product developed in production mode with customers informing you back and forth as whether you're on the correct path or not. And then, so they invest the bulk of for new development in this time period. You look for contracts that are one to two year contracts, whereas in if you're in discovery mode, you're looking for like six month contracts, maybe nine month contracts, but short term, three to nine months. Um, then you get to continuous improvement, and this is after the uncertainty um, has come down. You're pr it's pretty predictable what you want to do. Here's where you switch into cost savings mode. Um, I, I almost found that every project um, in legacy mode in all government work that I've seen, the cost of the project goes, goes up over time, and that's really a signal that people aren't efficiently doing continuous improvement. And this is really important. At this phase, you've proven value. Now look for cost savings. And it's so valuable to rip things out of systems that aren't being used. And this is really what, what you where you want to take things out of systems. And your price should come down every year. And if it's not, you're doing something wrong, right? And so you, you have to take that sort of 
aggressive approach with it. Now we're going to apply that back to the cone of uncertainty and the lean thinking model, and you see where the phases line up. And so with this chart, I could sit down with the CFO and say, hey, discovery, development, and continuous improvement, that's A funding, B funding, and C funding. Stop funding projects over the full life cycle. They should prove their value, right? First phase is to prove a minimum viable product. Second phase is prove the value. If you're not proving the value in that development phase, you need to go back and you shouldn't get the money to go into continuous improvement. And so this is where your funding lines up. This is true for acquisitions as well. Um, you know, all of this, each, each function, each, you know, executive in each group knew, okay, this is the advice we give. And if you remember from Anne's chart, she had that circle chart where we were talking about services and functions, pushing everybody back into the middle. This is the purpose of it. When you align all the CXOs together, they get pushed back into proper thinking. And then in the next couple of minutes, I'm gonna sum up this, this last slide. And this gets to the cultural change that everybody's been, been talking to. And it's so important because this really isn't an IT problem. This really isn't like, I got to the point where we could go in and save any project, but unless you start addressing the enterprise, it's like a firework. It, it's beautiful when it goes off, but then it goes dark right afterwards. So, the, you know, you really have to change the culture. And there's part of this is these four stages of competency, which was a study that was done by Noel Birch in 1970. And on the left, you have unconscious incompetence. And on the right, you have conscious competence. And then you go all the way up the scale there. And the left is I don't know what I don't know. And nobody should feel overconfident on the on this conference because we are all guilty of this. At some in something in our lives, we are all currently, right now, unconsciously incompetent. We just have yet to figure it out. And so we shouldn't get too bold in thinking where we know everything. The true is uh, it's true on the other side too, of the people who are unconsciously competent, this would be like a quarterback like Peyton Manning or something like that is so great at what they do. They apply what they know without thinking. And the reality here is, um, the reason I point to those two endpoints is, if in government people have been doing waterfall and trained in that their whole lives, we shouldn't expect them to be consciously incompetent, right? Right. We should expect them to be unconsciously incompetent, and we need to have the skills to help them identify that and bring them to the next level. And those skills are not beating them with a bat or something to that effect. It's applying services that your organization sets up so that they can help stand and help them make that 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 move forward. The other one, the unconscious incompetence is, um, and this was a mistake made in the early digital services movement in the U.S. where they kept talking about bringing people in from Silicon Valley to parachute and save government. It was a disastrous messaging because what, what you have is, um, you know, it's like bringing Peyton Manning in to be a quarterback's coach, and he's probably going to be a terrible quarterback coach because he doesn't know why he's so great at it. And what you really want are the people that are consciously competent because they can tell you why they get successes and why specifically they can do it. And they make the best types of coaches, and they happen to be the ones that are very good bringing people from unconscious incompetence to conscious incompetence. So I'll stop there because I think my time is up. Um, and uh, thank you for your time. And I think we're going to a panel. Is that right? Yes, thank you, Greg.